Friends, the music is playing, the room is swaying. That might be because I'm on a boat. I might be drunk. I don't know. It, it, it's three o'clock here on the East Coast, but um, maybe it's five o'clock where you are. Drinking time no longer has a meaning. I mean, I think that that if you if you if if you drink drink if you got them, the world is burning. But we are here to try to enjoy each other's company. It is Shakespeare's coffee break. Don't worry, I only actually have coffee in here. It's really good coffee though, and it's amazing. Special thanks to the Jack Dolls also for providing today's music. Hopefully, I hit the right button so that you can hear it too. Otherwise, I'm just enjoying this all on my lonesome. <laughs> but let's have a nice noisy slurp to get this week's production going. So here we go. Oh, that is some quality internet audio. We have amazing guests with us today. We have Neil McGarry and Daniel Ravapinto. Oh my God! Ah! Oh my God! There they are! There! Oh my God! They're here! I got nerds in the house. Oh, it's so great! So we're going to have a wonderful show. We're going to be talking about an amazing topic that doesn't get nearly enough people talking about it in mainstream, and that is diversity in fantasy and science fiction literature and also you know in television movies etc so sit back relax and enjoy the fun grab your cup of joe tell me what you have and if you have any questions for our guest today throw them up into the comments and i'll bring them on screen and we will ask so shakespeare's coffee break is starting now brought to you by the good people at my house because it's my internet and we're at my house and that's how this is working this is a really weird show i'm already starting off today but it's all good. We're going to have a great time. Let's bring on our guests. So we have Daniel Ravapinto and Neil McGarry. And I see it in that order because that's the order you're sitting in on my screen. Okay. <laughs> Hello, friends. Hello. Oh, welcome. Yeah. Welcome back to the show. It is so wonderful to uh, have you here today. Are you, are you drinking any coffee right now? Uh, I, I cannot partake anymore. Caffeine, oh, no. yeah, me and caffeine don't get along well these days, but uh, mm. I miss I miss you so much. I still mm. love you. <laughs> I'm just going to drink it here, looking not tempting at all. Mm. I'm not saying I made it fancy today out of a, with a French press. I'm not saying that at all, no. <laughs> you know, you can use a French press to do some very nice loose leaf tea as well. So... I highly recommend that. You know, like a good herbal, something nice. You're just like, <laughs> screw you, Shakespeare. Why'd I come yeah. on the show? <laughs> uh, Neil, what about you? You know, I'm just thinking, I never heard loose leaf apply to anything except those papers you use when you were in school and you used to rip from the <laughs> notebooks. Because I'm kind of a barbarian when it comes to those things. Oh, oh yeah, I used to rip those out of my notebook and rip, You oh, rip them out, but then, especially if it has the serrated edge so that you can then try to make it look nice. Yep. Um, I like to do that, but it doesn't, it's not an eight and a half by 11 page then, because yeah. when you take the edge off, when you take the serrated edge off, it's now a little bit narrower. And I'm like, what? Yeah. No, you're, you're wrong now. You're, you're a wrong piece of paper and I'm angry at you. So I get yeah. angry at it all the time. Yeah. But, it's so wonderful to have you uh, friends here with me here today. And I'm just very excited to talk about today's topic, where we're going to be talking about uh, diversity in uh, fantasy uh, literature, science fiction, which is a topic that was actually suggested by you to me. And when I say, hey, you want to come back on the show at some point? You're like, absolutely. So specifically, um, in your... A uh, trilogy of books, uh, the Grey City trilogy, beginning with Duchess of the Shallows, and then Fall of Venteris, and then Ruling Mask, none of which I've actually gotten to read yet. Um, but uh, you have diversity in there. But you, what I did read of yours was a fantastic essay uh, that you contributed to a textbook uh, four years ago. And I'm just going to hold it up. Hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, the essay is called In the Shadow of the Status Quo. And... Um, I wish everybody at home best of luck in getting it. I had to get it on Amazon, rent the book, because textbooks are pricey. But yeah. <laughs> go, it's well worth it. It is fantastic. And you talk about diversity specifically with um, both racial, um, ethnic, and then also in the LGBTQ community with, and you hit everything. And I, I feel that it is now time for me to shut it and you to start talking. <laughs> so oh. what attracted you to this topic? 
it's it's funny because um, we were talking about what we wanted to do for the essay because we had the opportunity of possibly being part of this book, and um, we had had this conversation, like much like our podcast is just something that we do anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then just turn a recorder on. This conversation in terms of specifically fantasy, but also I think science fiction can be pulled into it too, um, and how for a for a pair of genres that are so much about imagination and possibility, they so can fall into just patterns based on the status quo. Yeah, if you think about so much, so much fantasy involves restoring the king, fighting back this dreadful new order. Well, why do we want to restore a king? You know, there's nothing diverse about that kind of autocracy. You know, and why are uh, forces that bring change always evil? I mean, obviously Sauron is evil, right? <laughs> of course he is. But what we're saying yeah, is- Yeah, if you're saying Sauron isn't evil, I mean, they literally <laughs> call him the dark one, the evil one, the eye. I mean, it's kind of out there in the name, in the branding even. So just need to put that there. That's just PR. <laughs> That's just bad PR. Mm -hmm. In that case, he needs a different PR staff. Right. <laughs> I mean, Saruman is doing him no favors. I'm just right. let, I'm putting this out there. But continue, continue with your thesis. All right. <laughs> and and it, it was interesting because we opened with a quote from Charlie Strauss, who's a sci-fi author, about why he doesn't write fantasy. Uh, and he specifically says uh, it's, it's consolatory fiction, that it, it's basically about the restoration of a status quo. Uh, the, the, the good things are always in the past. Like, we, we sort of have this general pattern that we follow of like what these books have in common and specifically the paper deals with comparing and contrasting Tolkien's approach and George R. R. Martin's approach to fantasy and how they sort of those two points sort of define the beginning of an arc that we feel can go further. Yeah I mean let's take an example from A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin which everyone knows is the Game of Thrones TV series. Mm -hmm. so there's this talk about Daenerys becoming the queen right? Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, but Daenerys never thinks that the the privilege she would then enjoy should apply to other women who would still, under her rule, basically be the property of their fathers until they become the property of their husbands. And we see this over and over uh, in fantasy. If we go to Lord of the Rings, you know, do the hobbits gain anything from putting Aragorn on the throne? They don't lose anything, but what do they gain? And, and that's what we see over and over in these fantasy books, that people want to restore something from the past, but it doesn't get them anywhere. It just helps the person they're putting on the throne. So to, so to that end, my question is, especially in the time that Lord of the Rings was originally written, when he started it, in started the whole concept with the, writing The Hobbit and then also creating Middle Earth during World War One. To an extent, I would argue that, at least for the Hobbits, because the Shire was shown as almost the most idyllic version of everything, that it was to keep this nice thing going, that we have something that we're fighting for, and that is not the restoration of some glorious past, but rather, we have this great place, let's not lose it. And that's how maybe he looked at England at the time. Although I would argue that the Shire is a rather patronizing view of, oh, right. of that idyllic countryside because the simple country folk whose pleasures are found in food and drink and good conversation, um, he's writing it from the perspective of functionally landed nobility, which Frodo is. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, like it's, 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 it's like talking about like it, some comparison to say like uh, Downton Abbey talking about the, the wonderful idyllic life at Downton in terms of like ignoring what the servants have to do or ignoring the privilege of, of the Crowleys versus everybody else in the village. Like it's, it's this incredibly patronizing view of the English countryside. Yes. Um, and it, it, I agree with you. It's very much about the preservation of it, but you can see this conservative push against progress in the form of the scouring of the Shire. Because when the forces of evil come to the Shire, how do they destroy it? They build factories. They, you know, put people to work. They, you know what I mean? Like, uh, 
regular people get more influence, even though, of course, the influence is is backed by a bad force. But Ted Sandyman is the mm. one that becomes really important when what the book is really saying is that the Bagginses and the Brandy Bucks and the Tooks, the old landed gentry, shouldn't they really be in charge? Why should they be usurped? All right. See, and that is a thing I never actually thought while reading the book, and I've read the book many times. Um, for me, it was, I mean, not that Ted Sandyman shouldn't have um, more of a say in Hobbit society, but more rather that it was, let's say, an old school version, uh, a small C conservative viewpoint that progress for progress's sake mm. is not necessarily grand, which although those words now coming out of my mouth, I sound like Dolores Umbridge in book five. <laughs> <laughs> progress for progress sake, sake should be discouraged. And and for God's sakes, Potter, didn't you listen <laughs> to that speech? Well, well I mean, it, a lot of it is just both books and a lot of, of sort of what we refer to as Western high fantasy. It's suffused with this like, like romanticization of days gone by. Mm -hmm. The present is at its best when it's like the past. Our forefathers were greater than we, their, their emotions were deeper, art was greater. I mean, if you look at the beginning and sort of the arc of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, it is about an, a bygone era in which men were real men, et cetera, et cetera. And elves went west. Right. Like, like there's, but there is, there's this, this great sorrow through the whole thing. Magic is leaving the world. Glory and wonder are leaving the world. And men will inherit the bland remains. You know what I mean? Because the implication, of course, is that one doesn't see hobbits anymore. Uh, Tolkien's world of Middle Earth is our world in the past. And as you go further and further back, it becomes more magical, it becomes more grand. And George Martin does the exact same thing. Uh, the, the people uh, Daenerys is, is um, descendant from, the Valyrians had a great, you know, and wonderful kingdom that fell into the sea and, you know. To, to be fair, the Valyrians totally had it coming. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta put that out there. I oh, mean, yeah. and you can argue that you can argue that the since it never says the people or the humans of Numenor, but the men of Numenor, the Numenorians became a very decadent uh, people, and it w it was terrible, and they got thrown down. Um, the Valerians even more so because they actively uh, had the slave trade going on. So um, I, I will I will say they totally had it coming. Hot take here: no loss to the world. But 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 from Martin's point of view, it is a loss. It's clearly a loss. Uh, it, it, it is something great that is now lost, and we are we are lessers, you know, playing in the in the ruins of our betters. Well, think about this. All right, let's go back to Lord of the Rings. Okay, Sauron is defeated by forces from the past. He's defeated by Gandalf, who is a Maiar, right? Yes, and he's only on Earth for a limited period of time. He's defeated by people who have weapons, me and Western S, which comes from Numenor, which no, these weapons aren't made anymore. If you don't have one, too bad for you. They're defeated by magics and ents and things that are no longer going to exist as they had. In a sense, it's really a victory of they have to go into the past to defeat evil. You know, the theme really, as we see, is not about embracing the new. It's really about hearkening to the old. To, to, to face the future. And that's what small C conservatism is, or even capital C conservatism. Well, and, and there's an element to this that we haven't touched on that I find so disturbing about this, which is that that past is exclusively white. Mm. Like, we talk about like this hierarchy that Tolkien has of the Numenorians versus the lesser men. Oh, he says, uh, Faramir says, you have three categories of men. You got the really good ones, which are the white people, the Numenorians and their kin, then like the lesser white people, but they're still okay. Like Rohan. one would argue that they are even more white. That the Rohirrim are even more white than the Gondorians, because the, the the Gondorians you at least have variations of hair coloring. I mean, the Numen, I mean, the Rohirrim, it's like we are blonde, and I am Carl Urban. I mean, there, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, but, you know, but the, the, they still wear Crocs, so they can't be among the high men. Fair enough. I I I I submit. I yield the floor. 
But that hierarchy is really disturbing because it happens amongst men, it happens amongst elves, and always the hierarchy is the closer you get to Aryan, honestly, oh, yeah. the higher you are on this hierarchy. And it's incredibly disturbing when you see it. Like, I cannot now unsee it. Well, like, I mean, the hobbits are like that too. The fair hills are the blonde haired, blue eyed ones. They're the most rare and they're the most obviously closest to elves. The elves have the Vanyar and the Noldor and the Avari. You know, it's all this, it's not even subtle. It really smacks you in the face, especially when Faramir says, like, here's the three categories and the people on bottom are all dark. Mm. Haradrin, the Easterlings, the Southrons. Yeah. And, and wow. Those are the forces that go over to Sauron. Those are the more easily corrupted. Those are the more evil people, which is an awful theme in terms of like the mythology people have come up with. Like in terms of like you you see it uh where D, &D is struggling with the idea of the drow as you know, people who are evil and were cursed and were made dark skinned because of it. Like these are awful narratives we've had throughout history. That like, that is one thing I, I I really appreciate in current up to the date D and D of saying you know what we're re-exam we're we're turning off I mean a lot of you did it on your own anyway but we are turning off official things of there are evil races and it's just there are evil people and the races within um within this uh, world uh, there are many hues it's a united colors of Benetton ad. <laughs> so you can you can you can you can have a good orc character or a good goblin right. character, and then also obviously terrible humans or elves or or what have you. So I think that's good, and I think a lot of this could have been largely not just overlooked, um, but made right if in Jackson's Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy and then in The Hobbit we had seen actively performers of color on screen as elves, as humans, well, of like Gondorians. If, if, for instance, if Boromir, if Boromir had been um, a black man uh, or, or Aragorn or, or Legolas, anybody. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, no, yeah, he wrote his thing and we're just simply updating it for reality as we know it, putting every, making all of fantasy an incredibly inclusive place from the jump. Well, I mean, that's where we sort of conclude our paper, where we talk about, you know, some of these things are like this invading force of diversity coming into the conservative land, as it were. Um, it, making fantasy or media more diverse is, in fact, doing the opposite, because reality, as you said, is diverse. The world we live in is diverse. And if we make our media more closely match reality, that's not an invading force. That's that's making it accurately reflect the world. And exactly. it's actually really funny that you specifically mentioned Jackson's stuff because I remember, uh, I think it might've been in The Hobbit that you had um, black elves or something like that in backgrounds of scenes or something like that, or even human characters and people flip the heck out. Oh and yeah, they lost. Pardon part me for swearing, I'm gonna do it once. I virtually never drop any kind of harsh language on this show, but. Here we go. We're going to go into the one shot. Oh my God, Peter Jackson! How dare you? Um, this isn't how it was like. First off, it's a fantasy world. Right. There, there is no histor historical. That, that's what it was like back then. But also, they lost their shit. They yes. lost their shit. And I'm sorry, I said it twice, and that's 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 my PG right there. But <laughs> when people fall on the trope of realism, oh. Historical realism. Legolas rides a shield as a freaking hoverboard. Not even a surfboard. It's a hoverboard in that moment. And then he leaps off of it, uses his back foot to kick it into the neck of an orc. First off, awesome. Second, <laughs> that's not, I'm sorry. Uh, what? No, no one could ever do that in the history of ever. You want to talk about real? Let's talk about that moment. One of the greatest moments in cinematic history. Yeah, that's not real. Shut your face. And it's I, wonderful. I, 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 I hear people um, talk about George Martin's world, Westeros, right? Yes. And some would suggest that, like, why aren't women, why can't they inherit just like their brothers? And people will be like, oh, no, that's not realistic. Dragons and ice demons and fire <laughs> sorceresses, they have no problem with. But the, oh, yeah. The, of an egalitarian society in terms of, of you know, a female enfranchisement, oh, that's just beyond the pale. 
Well, and we talk about that, that like there are so many characters like Cersei and Daenerys, these people who come into power and don't consider sharing it with people who are like them, other women, uh, or changing the role of women in the society they're in. I mean, Cersei's whole arc is this very Greek style, oh, that I were born a man, you know what I mean, response to the inequities of being born a woman in the society. It never occurs to her to do anything different. Yeah, and you know, look, we love Tolkien. We love George Martin. I mean, like he, those books are among my favorite ever. But I mean, there's a problem there. You know, when you have the 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 women in the story are are acutely described. You know exactly what they look like, and the mm. men are usually painted with a very broad brush. The only time you know something about them is if they're disfigured in some way. Yes. Right. But like the women, you know, with excruciating detail what they look like. I mean, that's a specific view of women. That's well, being promoted. It's very well. It's very much the male gaze. And it, it, it incredibly is. It's the same thing that we've seen for seventy years in comics, and also for just forever. And let's just say in sitcoms, you you have a relatively sad sack of a man uh, with um, a relative a near perfect 10 of a woman or what we think of societally as perfect 10. So you have right. Leah Ramini with um, Kevin James. And not to say that that couldn't be a couple in real life. It's just, it's a trope. It's yeah. a trope. And it's just like, all right, address it as such. It's just like, they, it should be a, it should be like, Oh, you're out of my league. And it's just like, Oh wait, am I out of your league? And then they could have that as a real conversation. And she's like, no. And she could be like, no, you're out of my league. I mean, like reverse it, flip it, have the perfect looking um, partner feel like they are inferior to the normal looking person. I mean, do that. Well, I mean, basically what it comes down to is sort of a lack of imagination to a certain extent. It really I mean, is. It's, it's changing. I mean, we reference this in the, in the essay that, you know, there is, thank goodness there have been, it, it, I think it's more an awareness of the fact that it's always been there, that there are people of color and queer people who are, are writing, you know, fantasy and science fiction. I'm an enormous fan of like uh, Chip uh, Laney and, you know, other sci-fi writers. We specifically mentioned like the 100,000 uh, Kingdoms and other sort of modern fantasy series that have people of color as their uh, protagonists. And and what makes me so sad is like when we talked about um, uh, Lord of the Rings, you can see it in like in Star Wars and stuff that when, I, I think as geeks <laughs> and as nerds, uh, we, we, in a world of geek culture triumphant, we get so protective of the things that we love or the way we think they should be. And rather than being more inclusive with them, we become so protective that we we gatekeep. Because you could see it in the introduction of people of color in as heroes in the new Star Wars films. Absolutely. Like, one of the actresses was forced off of um, Twitter oh, because she couldn't deal with the she like the tsunami of, of hatred yeah that was thrown at her um absolutely and it's like i mean i have very mixed feelings about the star wars movies and that's a whole other conversation to have but um like that was one of the things i really appreciated about the newest ones was that particularly i think it was the second one had this idea that anyone can be a hero in this world yes. all of us like that was what was so weird about like the the middle movies in the Star Wars series with the midichlorians and everything, the, the force was sort of this egalitarian ideal that we could all reach towards and all have something to do with. And, and I mean, I've taught, we've talked at length about the idea of hero being bandied about as, as a, a dangerous word because it, it relieves people from doing their own human duty. Like, it, oh, that's the job of a hero. I'm not that kind of person. I can't do that. Um, and that's kind of what I liked about some of the Star Wars films is that anyone like here here we're gonna have a guy who starts as a stormtrooper and he's black and he's one of our heroes and we have this woman who's one of the jedi and you know what i mean like it it was just so great to see something other than the same tropes and the same images we've seen for years i'm gonna pause you right there because that is a topic near and dear to my heart so we're gonna pause right there for a moment uh as i go and pay some bills so we're here talking diversity in fantasy and science fiction. We're talking ethnic and racial diversity, LGBTQ diversity. We're talking it all right here on Shakespeare's Coffee Break. But now we've got to pay some bills because friends, uh, today's show is brought to you in part by 
the good people at Hill Storage and Rigging Company. Hill Storage and Rigging Company, no job too large or too small, located in Middletown, Pennsylvania. You can, you can call them at 717-944-7676 and go to hillrigging.com. Enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing your equipment is in skilled and experienced hands with services from our machine movers and erectors in Middletown, PA. Established in 1967, Hill Storage and Rigging Company is a family-owned and operated full-service millwright serving industries in the Mid-Atlantic states and beyond. We are a woman owned small business with hours of operation Monday through Friday, 7 to 5 Eastern Time, available Saturdays and Sundays by appointment only. Again, that number is 717-944-7676, and you can find them online at hillrigging.com. Special thanks to Hill Rigging for being our sponsor here on Shakespeare's Coffee Break. If you would like to become a sponsor, you can do so. Just email me, Shakespeare at ShakespeareProves.com. That is Shakespeare at ShakespeareProves.com. You can send me a message right here on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Shakespeare's Coffee Break. And while you're there, go, go give it a like. It is the only way I judge myself worth in life. And why you're going and liking my stuff, like... Because I know you do. Go and like the main Facebook page. I'm over 5,000 likes now, and I want more. Yep, so facebook.com slash Shakespeare Approves. Go follow me on Twitter at Shakespeare Approves. Instagram, all the things. Go like and subscribe to the YouTube page, youtube.com slash C slash Shakespeare Approves. Do it. Because some of the content is soon only going to be there. And then you're going to be like, Shakespeare, I want it. I'm like, go over to the other thing. I want the likes everywhere because I'm a greedy bastard. But that being said, friends, we are going to uh, come back into this wonderful conversation on diversity and inclusion in science fiction and fantasy with our deans of diversity and inclusion, Neil McGarry and Daniel Ravapinto. Who better to talk about diversity and inclusion and fantasy and science fiction than three white men? Boom. Although I will say that uh, there have been a lot of um, particularly like writers of color and stuff who are like, yeah, stop inviting me only to like diversity panels and stuff yeah. like that. That stuff y'all have to work out on your own. I, can, I have other stuff. I can I, yeah, I, I have, I have, I have, I have a friend who says, hey, uh, post this quite a lot. Uh, hey, white people, racism and diversity are both your problem. Figure it out. And it's yep. like, all right. And it's like, call me, um, call me if you want me to interject any good ideas, but otherwise um, I'm focusing on me right now. I'm doing some self-care. <laughs> I'm just like, you're amazing. I love you. No. Um, real quick, um, uh, fast lightning round before we get back into the Star Wars thing real quick with anybody can be a hero because I have strong feelings on that. Um, and largely it's, yeah, anybody can be a hero, should be a hero, do it. Um, Favorite uh, three non-white or non-male uh, sci-fi or fantasy uh, authors. Oh, uh, really big fan of uh, Chip Delaney. Um, uh, Lynn Flewelling deserves some recognition because she had gay characters in her books in the nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, Ursula Le Guin, uh, Madeline Engel. Mm -hmm. um, you took two of mine. Ah, <laughs> Yeah, I could, just, I could just keep going. Um, I mean, goodness, there's Robin Hobb. There are so many. And, and you know, that's something that really annoys me, that the work is out there. Yeah. It has to get attention. I mean, yeah, yeah we were talking about this. That I, and, and that there is more diverse media than you would expect, even from people that um, you wouldn't expect it from. Uh, Sturgeon, I stumbled on one of his short stories from 1953, that um, the main plot point is the homosexuality of one of the main characters. Um, and apparently he had a heck of a time getting it published. Um, the, the media has been out there for a really long time. It's just people haven't been engaging with it. I'm also a particular fan of Octavia Butler and she was taken from us far too soon in the early 2000s. Oh goodness. I've read a lot of her recently and it's, it's, it's dangerous particularly now because she is so good and so prescient in some way and it's right. so depressing and it's so hard to read in some way We're living in the world that she predicted to an extent yeah uh I, I have actually had to stop reading i think it's the parable of the sower recently mm -hmm. it's just like yeah this is getting way too real um no oh, that that's like me i had to uh stop reading uh the handmaid's tale because I'm like, oh no, we are there. Yeah. I, and I only and I started reading it because we I don't have HBO, so I can't watch the show. Um, but like, oh, everyone's talking about this. I'm, I'm gonna go read it. It was a book, great. And I'm like, I got halfway through. I'm like, all right, and we're done for now. 
All right. But to an extent, I need, uh, that's an, also an argument to pick it back up because good science fiction should make you uncomfortable to an extent. You know, it's like fantasy should do the same, and it often doesn't. You know, I had I never read a gay character in a fantasy book until I was in my 30s, right? So how how closely can I connect with fantasy that doesn't reflect me or any you know or anything that, that I think about? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing we try to do when we write our work. You know, obviously we can't speak for people who are black. We can't speak for women because we're not either of those, right? Yes. But what we can at least try to do is to include them, right? I mean, we can try, and that's all anybody can do with these things is just try. And 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 it's about empathizing, um, on in a true and real sense. Because yes, I can to a, a lot. Um, I can't say I I can write the gay experience because I am not. I'm heterosexual. I can't say I write from a woman's perspective uh, the way a woman could or a person of color uh, the way they could. Um, but the, to another extent, that is the point of fiction, of saying, all right, I'm going to try to inhabit this character. And that's also why another thing we have in common, D&D, &D, is very important because a wonderful thing to do in order to try to gain some empathy is play someone who doesn't look like you. Um, for the character, and and I'm not saying no, don't do it on TV or something, or like where there could be a person of color or a trans person or a woman to play that role. But in in your own tabletop game with your friend, yes, play. If you're a man, play the woman. If you're a woman, play the man. Um, do something different. Get outside of that comfort zone, and gain a little bit of empathy, especially when your 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 nerdy friend who lives in his, his parents' basement and he's 52 still says, oh, I'm at the pub and I'm getting wasted. And are there girls there? I want to do them. I mean, no, I mean, it's funny. It's a trope, but on the other point, it's like, dude, no. And then have him play, th have that guy play uh, a female character, have him play a, a, a female dragonborn and be like, I will kill you little man. And just like, set him on fire that'd be amazing i think that should be what he does and then in the world when he sees that happen it's like oh right i i will set this i will set this d-bag on fire but another thing so real quick i'm gonna redirect it I'm, you're seeing i'm wearing cargo shorts right now. i'm trying to hide my legs because i'm very in character right now <laughs> why would i wear cargo shorts other than the fact that they are very comfortable <laughs> um Star Wars, and anyone can be a hero. Now, many, 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 many people had very strong feelings on um, the Last Jedi, the, um, the second movie in the in the in the let's call it the sequel trilogy. Um, there's like, oh no, uh, Ryan um, Johnson uh, destroyed it. He made he made Luke not as heroic and all and all of this stuff. Um, the only problem I had with it was the whole Princess Leia of it. I think Princess Leia. I mean past being prologue, uh, Princess Leia should have been the one to crash the ship into uh, the destroyer and let Laura Dern go off and be the hero in the third movie. Mm. But then I felt that how so many people enjoyed the final movie more than they enjoyed um, Last Jedi because it was JJ undoing a lot of stuff. It's like, I thought that was a disservice. It's like, I thought the greatest thing ever said, and yeah, hard truths often come from the voices of the, vi from the mouths of the villains when Kylo Ren said, you're nobody. Your parents were anything special. Mm -hmm. They left you there because reasons. And, and then you see that little boy balancing the, uh, his broom using the force at the very end of the film. It's just like, and the telling the story of Star Wars and all of these heroes uh, who were nobody. You have, you have Finn and you have Rose. And it's not a perfect movie, but it took Star Wars into a new interesting direction that mm. this is for everybody. And then the final film, oh, walks that's... Out, it walks it back. Yeah, mm -hmm. It made it milk toast. We go from a person who is important and interesting because of her choices versus a person who is important because of what her bloodline is, which is straight out of fantasy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's, I mean, mm -hmm. Neil has argued that the biggest danger to the Star Wars universe is the Skywalker bloodline. Word. Indeed. Uh, if they didn't exist, <laughs> so much damage would have been undone. Yeah, like half of them turn into Sith. 
it isn't worth it. The ratio, they, they got to go back and fix that formula. And see, I, and if it was a thing of, let's say the sequel trilogy had nothing to do with the Skywalkers, all right? And then in another 10, 15, 20 years, there's a, like, it's, like, move the move it forward well like in advance hundreds or thousands of years in the star wars universe or and then you have a new skywalker line coming up it's just like oh that that could have been interesting it's like oh here's this ghost of the past that hey kids your grandparents remember because that's how all the movies are now and everything that would have been a neat twist but or even saying since the final movie is called the rise of skywalker the Jedi aren't Jedi anymore. It's Skywalkers. And it's mm -hmm. like, that would have been a fun twist. And it's like, no, it's like all of these wonderful things you just shat on. Ugh. That makes three, by the way. Shut your face. You don't know me. <laughs> hey, FPC's listening. <laughs> Are they? Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. I, I, I'm just doing a silly show here where I'm English and... 16, very deep in 16th century character. I, I know nothing about your internet FCC or your iPhones or your helicopters. I know none of this stuff. No. What? Anyway. <laughs> and it's, it's sad because you would think that science fiction would be sort of more forward looking because of what it is. But I mean, we've talked about this at like sci-fi from the seventies being basically uh, uh, or, or even earlier, it's just like, oh, it's the future, but everybody is acting in gender roles from 1950. Like yeah. uh, this is this incredibly advanced culture that is exactly like America in you know 1982, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of of the makeup of the characters and the attitudes in terms of gender and like nothing has changed. And what's bizarre is we've talked about this, the things that you miss. I'm a huge fan of Ian M. Banks uh, and his culture novels, and they are so modern in some ways, and it blows my mind that the first ones were written in the 70s. Um, there, there is media out there that is diverse and more inclusive and, you know, so on and so forth, but it just gets lost. Yeah. So, you know what, when we decided to write our fantasy novels, we were like, you know what, we're going to do everything you're not supposed to do. And, uh, you know, I guess it's working for us. I don't know. Uh, I mean, like, because it is, it, it's, we try to get away from like, or, or, we have this constant need to subvert everything. So like every trope that's in there is like completely undermined or twisted in some way. Like there are no chosen ones. Our main character is a woman. You know what I mean? Like yes. it's, you know, her, her, uh, she has a relationship with a, a, another main character that I feel like haven't seen represented in fantasy at all between men and women uh, in, in, in that sort of narrative. And you know, we should tell this. All right, I won't mention any names, right? Because we probably shouldn't, because she could be listening. <laughs> but the agent that we worked with, right? We were we had an agent for a while, right? And then she dumped us by email, which is a great story, but okay, that's later. So I was also dumped by email, but it wasn't by an agent. <laughs> it was by it, 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 it was by someone I am not married to. So that is <laughs> there's that. No, I I am very yeah. lucky. To, I'm very lucky to be married to a person who did not dump me by email, and we've been together for 15 years now. So that's nice. But yeah, um, yeah I was dumped by email um, when I had a Hotmail account. Wow, that yeah, just, that, that dates you more than the Shakespearean outfit. <laughs> See, there we go. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's. But anyway, continue your your agent who dumped you via okay. email. So we're you know we're proofing the the manuscript back and forth, and she actually this is a woman. She actually told us, you know, you should make sure your main character is a virgin because that's the trope. You know, and we were gobsmacked. Like you would never be like, are we all sure that Frodo hasn't had sex yet? Because that's maniacally important. I mean, also, in that case, Frodo, even though he owns the house, and by the time that the main adventure begins, he's 50. <laughs> I need to put that out there. Yeah. But, <laughs> oy. Oh, goodness. Well, speaking of books, this is a good time now to uh, talk about you. You have three books in a wonderful uh, the series that I re um, intend on reading soon. The Grey City, starting with The Duchess of the Shallows, then going into the fall of Antares and the ruling mask. So let's talk about that. What is the series about and how does diversity play into it? Yeah, what we've done is we've created this fog bound city that has many mysteries. 
And what we've tried to do is make sure that people who typically don't get to be in the spotlight in standard fantasy, women and sexual uh, minorities and people of color get a chance to do things that are sometimes heroic, sometimes villainous, but they get to have real motivations and they don't just serve as sidekicks or as vehicles to express some kind of societal, you know, uh, prejudice. And I mean, it's not a perfect place at all. Uh, it takes place in this imperial city of Rodas. Um, some people have been like, oh, this is a horrible place to live. And it kind of is in some ways. Um, but we don't have characters simply accept the roles that they're handed to by the society they exist in. They have choices, they have autonomy. Um, and some of them make good choices, some of them make poorer choices. Um, like, But they're their choices. You know, I think that to take an example from the real world, we're often told that 200 years ago, everyone thought slave, everyone in America thought slavery was fine, right? Well, the slaves didn't think so, but no one asked them. So what we try to do in our book is ask the people who are disenfranchised by a system what they think of it. And I think we've put a lot of work into, it's, it's really funny that we've been talking about Tolkien because I, I feel like a lot of fantasy, everything, I mean, we talked, the, the, the title of our paper was in the status of the shadow, uh, shadow of the status quo. Um, a lot of modern fantasy takes place in the shadow of, of Tolkien. Sure, um, of course. Uh, literature is a conversation. Uh, you are reacting to other pieces of work and, and putting your own view out there. And in some ways, I think we've taken sort of a page from Martin and other writers like him in that we've tried to realistically think about, you know, given this world and these sort of fantasy magical premises, what's a realistic outcome? What, what would real people do mm -hmm. rather than sort of, because uh, Tolkien can lean towards the epic, towards the the almost lyrical in terms of like the uh, Cimmerillion. It's it's mythical to the point of you can't really connect to the characters. They're, they're so much bigger than life. They're not people. Um, and so we've done a lot of work in terms of the internal politics of the city, the, the internal economics, its history. Um, and at the same time, hopefully you don't just get lost in that because I feel like world building is a dirty word in fantasy sometimes where it's it's 15 pages of this kind of architecture or something like that. I think we try to put the story first in all cases and have this hopefully rich background that we've developed inform the narrative as opposed to being the point of the narrative. We'll see. All right. Well, friends, the books are the uh, two, I'm, I'm sorry, the books are the Grace City trilogy. Uh, book one is The Duchess of the Shallows. Book two, The Fall of Antares. Book three, The Ruling Mask. And you can get to all of them by going to Neil and Dan's website at peckable.com. That's P-E-C-C-A-B-L-E.com. And also support uh, support the boys on uh, Patreon. Become their patron. Go do it. It's, uh, it's good uh, karma. Go to patreon.com slash nitpicking. Nitpicking because of the wonderful wonderful amazing podcasts that i'm a fan of uh nitpicking uh babylon 5 is uh, the current one but also next generation uh so uh that's uh how i uh got them on my radar and i hope they are very much on yours now so much more we could discuss uh uh um, fans are talking here on the show uh, james ellaby uh was saying back in star wars would really have loved for them to have explored the stormtroopers as actual people angle which came up in the final act of the final movie it's just like oh oh well, yeah let's here's a thing we've ignored since the beginning of the first movie and uh, we'll bring it back but in the final half hour, um, it's just like, uh, no. And it's, it's something that grows out of like, if you look at like the source of Star Wars, it's clearly a love letter to Lucas's, um, you know, childhood and the serials yes. of, of the period. And a lot of those stories have disposable characters, it, like the stormtroopers, like exactly. these waves of people you don't care about that you can blow up and push off cliffs and who cares? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Star Trek has its red shirts, you know, who who die at the service of, of the real characters. Lord of the Rings has the orcs, you know, you can just yeah. slay hundreds and thousands of them, it doesn't matter. Which, um, for that, one of my favorite things, I mean, you see them in the Lord of the Rings movies, I'm um, so beautifully executed by Jackson, but 
as we can see, flawed um, in some ways, um, especially the Hobbit films. <laughs> I didn't even watch all of them. Yeah. Oh, uh, I haven't seen the final one. I didn't. I'm like, nah, I'm good. As soon as as soon as it was a CGI um, Billy Connolly riding a CGI giant warthog, I'm like, all right, good, I'm done. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, but I mean, and I understand it was a CGI Billy Connolly because he's dealing with uh, severe illness and everything, so he wasn't able to go and film in person. But still, come on, people. Anyway, um, in that you see the disposability of the orcs, but also then have a few that stick out as characters that almost then point out that the orcs are so disposable. And, mm. but also with orcs being a relatively short lived species, that orc general <laughs> at the orc general who had all the goiters on him at yeah. uh, the battle of Gond at the battle of Gondor uh, at the white city. And it's just like, where did, where did he come from? <laughs> I, just, I want to know that, but the orcs also gave me one of the mo give you in um, goodness uh, uh, the two towers one of the most memorable scenes, uh, in my opinion, uh, when they're sitting around and they start arguing amongst themselves. Uh, we have we haven't had anything but maggoty bread for three whole days, and just like yeah. you're actually seeing them engage with each other as people, and that is really interesting. Oh, I'm a sucker for any sort of narrative that takes place in the uh, corners of another narrative. So things like uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Where you I hate that movie. I hate that movie. Oh, I love that play. I'm a huge Stopper fan though. The so. play, I, the play I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, a, I'm going to be reading uh, later this week, just on my own, a friend of, um, a mutual friend of ours, Maisha, uh, Elle and I, oh she, when she's saying, Neil and Dan, big hugs. And she's oh. texting me, how do you know Neil and Dan? Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, she uh, she sent she, she sent me a physical copy of it that I'm going to go to the post office and pick up probably tomorrow. Um, the play, I'm intrigued, but I feel that the movie is so incredibly flawed, and that's going to be a topic of another day uh, when we do Shakespeare reviews, uh, starting in three weeks. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of things existing in the corners and like find out, like devote an episode to them, so to speak. But uh, speaking of episodes, you have uh, nitpicking Babylon Five. Uh, you just had uh, we're reaching, I guess, the midpoint of season th uh, four, three, three, yeah. three uh, for you um, with um, War Without End. You just uh, released uh, your commentary for part two, so that is a brilliant piece, and we could talk. We, I need you to come back, and we're going to talk more about this topic, diversity in science fiction and fantasy, because this is a, an amazing, wonderful topic that is so fruitful and have you as part of a larger panel, too. One question uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, Carnival Row, um, but a uh, question from James, who's watching, says, what do you think of the way the show Carnival Row deals with the world building and diversity? I haven't seen it. I've seen, I think, the first episode this is the one with the fairies in london do i have maybe that i don't yeah. know let's assume yes yeah um uh, the, the fairies in this room can't talk about the fairies <laughs> in london. not yet uh i know i know a little bit about it i think i watched the first episode um uh it was interesting i i it was something that i wanted to watch more of um but i can't speak specifically to the series yeah all right um and one final thing, Neil, um, your brother, Sean, says Last Jedi Forever, best of the entire franchise. Johnson tried to show them what their real storytelling looks like, but they didn't listen. Yep, they backed down. Uh, he will defend Ryan Johnson. My brother will defend him forever. But I think reasonably so. Like, like there's, a, there's a strong... I mean, I don't think it's the strongest in the franchise. I think that... Um, it's not, but it took the biggest swing. It did what Empire Strikes Back did, and it took a big swing and changed the way the narrative was going, because the first one, which is still Star Wars, do not fight with me on this, the first one, uh, it, it's a silly, fun adventure story, and it's fun, and the good guys win, the bad guys don't, and plain, pure, and simple. Cool. Yay! Um, and it and it's cleverly numbered episode four at the with the opening crawl, and and it's just oh we're dropping you in the middle of a story because the middle of the story is always the most interesting. Great, brilliant job. 
Empire Strikes Back changes it and makes it darker. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Jedi makes it fluffy and you have teddy bears. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and also shows that evil can be redeemed. All right, that's neat. This one, Last Jedi is like, hey, let's take all of it and now turn it on its head and show anyone can be a hero. It doesn't matter your parentage. The whole epicness of this space fantasy doesn't have to be epic because of birth, as you were saying, but based on who you are. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Harry Potter saga and the concept of Gryffindors are brave, bold, and daring, courageous, and that anyone and you can step up and be the hero, such as Neville Longbottom. I feel that is one of the greatest services that that um, series gave problematic uh, issues of the author right now uh, aside. Well, it's interesting that you bring up Harry Potter because we recently saw uh, we were we recently saw a video about this that sort of posited the idea that Harry Potter uh, sort of weirdly subverts the whole idea of magic that um, so much of magic like mystical magic is about um, trying to get you can't get something for nothing that there's always equivalent, uh, equivalent exchange and that sort of whole idea and Harry Potter sort of weirdly bourgeois like uh, scientific version of magic where yeah you just go to school and you study enough and you can you can get stuff for free yeah. uh, like it was it, it's it's funny because we've been talking about it and, and you know uh, its authors current issues aside um, yeah it's it's it, it, it's so, I think, encouraging in some ways the, the topic we're talking about in terms of like diversity and fantasy and stuff like that. There's so much out there now. Um, I'm so excited that there are series like um, Lovecraft Country that's coming to HBO, the, the really best-selling book. Um, the new Lando Calrissian series that was just announced. But I, I particularly am, am a huge fan of stuff. That, that makes me happy. I'm, just, I'm sorry. Lando was, as a kid, as a kid... As a little kid in the 80s and then as a middle-sized kid in the 90s, um, and I'm still a middle-sized kid because I'm only 5'5", five five, um, Lando was the coolest person ever. Like People were like, oh, I want to be Han Solo because Han Solo is cool. He just shoots Greedo. You're like, yeah, that's pretty That's pretty great. But Lando, Lando's like, I'm not going to break a sweat. Hey, hey. And I'm like, Lando's so cool and he wears capes. He wears capes. I know. I know. He rocks that cape oh my gosh Never, you know, i'm gonna i'm about to queen out on that cape so i'm just gonna stop right but now I mean, I mean what's also really cool about him is that he steals every scene he's in he has so little screen time compared to some of the other characters and yet he's so memorable well you know what might make what might make lando memorable is this i feel like we all want to be luke skywalker in our heads that's what we are but we're kind of closer to Lando, who's sort of fumbling his way through life and trying to get it right and messing up. No, time. see, Lando's a guy fumbling. So I think in that case, I'd say we're all closer to Han, but fumbling our way through life, maybe having some luck. Lando is a guy fumbling his way through life, but rolling natural twenties the entire time. He's just <laughs> like, hey, hey, I just somehow became the governor of Cloud City, <laughs> and, and and then like, I'm gonna run away, I'm gonna betray the Empire, and I'm gonna become a rebel general. <laughs> And it's just like it constantly works for Lando. And then he shows up at the end. He's the hero. And that made me happy. That is one part of of uh, the Rise of Skywalker I loved. Lando coming in. But it was a thing that we've seen so much in the last few years that it was the, as someone was putting it on a, another podcast, the on your left moment. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, all right, here we are. Here's the cavalry. Here's ridiculous numbers of cavalry. Mm -hmm. But that part made me happy. And Real quick, coming back to everybody's a hero, that made that part of Rise of Skywalker did make it feel like everyone is a hero because it's like, we're here, we've got you, we've got your back. Who's here? Everybody. And you have everybody. That so it was like the entire galaxy is here for this fight. So we could go on forever and we're at nearly an hour. And so, uh, gentlemen, I'm gonna have to have you to come back and we're gonna have more of this conversation. You're brilliant and I love you. All right. Also, Maisha, Black Harmony, I mean, yeah, Harmony, Black Hermione in uh, The Cursed Child uh, is a brilliant move um, because it is more diversity in the Harry Potter universe. We've seen diversity on the outsides, on the edges, side characters. However, J.K. Rowling was quite correct when she originally said uh, when they cast a black woman to be Hermione Granger for the stage version. She goes, the only real description given of Hermione, is she has bushy brown hair. And um, originally large front teeth that she wants to get fixed and her parents being dentists hate. 
So that's fine. Um, and now I that when I hear the audiobooks and I reread the books, that's how I always picture Hermione. Um, mm -hmm. Head canon. Hermione is, uh, um, is this brilliant little br British black child who I see from Doctor Who in my head. Uh, the girl, do you remember the episode? You remember the episode uh, where the little girl was drawing the pictures, and then right. there was people were getting sucked into it, and there was this demon alien thing that just wanted a family. That's all. Yeah, that little girl, she's amazing. Go look it up. It's amazing, and brilliant. <laughs> but <laughs> friends, thank you. This uh, has been a very long episode of Shakespeare's Coffee Break, and if you've enjoyed it half as much as I've enjoyed performing performing it and hosting it then i've enjoyed it twice as much as you did and that's called math and whatever you feel the show is worth a one a five a ten for a 50 i will happily detail your car because i got no pride <laughs> throw it into my digital hack go to coffee.com slash shakespeare that's ko-fi.com slash shakespeare and buy me a cup of coffee and i will also for 20 dollars over there write you an original sonnet that's what i do now here in the quarantine times. And I'm getting pretty good at it. You can also go become a Patreon of the arts by going to patreon.com slash Shakespeare. And there is still time also to donate to the Hamlet Christmas special uh, uh, Indiegogo to pay the actors for that campaign. Go to igg.me slash AT slash Hamlet Xmas in July special. Go right there, that link. And uh, help pay for the actors who were in last Wednesday's wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, we've had over 1,800 views now, and I just want to uh, get them their just desserts. Um, go support uh, Neil McGarry and Daniel Ravapento uh, for uh, their writing for their podcast. Go and do all of the good things for them. Go to their patreon.com slash nitpicking. Go to their website, peckable.com, and buy their books. Go do all of the things and support my guests. Gentlemen, Thank you so much for being on here. I love you. You love me. There's mutual glorious affection. We'll see you next time.